Many industrial innovations have gone into production as a result of the untiring efforts of dedicated engineers. The Finnish Defence Force's request for tenders from manufacturers speeded up the development of radio telephones in Finland in the early 1960s. The companies involved in the development work included Nokia, as well as the radio and television manufacturer Sonora, which was later merged with Nokia. Lasse Lindrus and Marti Juva, both enthusiastic radio amateurs and professional radio engineers, were involved in the process. On our spare times, weekends and so, we built pretty quickly two a pair of radio telephones which were needed uh, to demonstrate to the army people our capability on that area. But no deals were forthcoming. The engineers had developed a product with commercial potential, but... If we had made a business plan in Savara, we had never started a radio telephone operation. In the late 1960s, the Finnish Post and Telecommunications Administration began planning an in-car radio telephone network for use on highways, known as ARP. The ARP network was ready by the beginning of the 1970s, and within a few years covered the whole country. Radio telephone operations changed from closed systems to systems open to all. Initially, the calls were transmitted manually. The location of the call receiver had to be known, and the call was conducted on the simplex principle, meaning both sides had to take turns to speak. But simultaneous speech was soon to become possible. The Finnish Post and Telecommunications Administration owned the ARP network. The consumer purchased the telephone set. This heralded the start of mass production of radio telephones for the consumer market. The early radio telephone systems created the technology for the mobile phone industry, their makers and users. Did the pioneers imagine what was to come? But the answer is very easy. Never. In the late 1970s, the Nordic Telecommunications Utilities decided to develop a joint analog mobile telephone network called Nordic Mobile Telephone, NMT. A new era began, but there was still caution about investing in a new production plant. The Nordic networks were opened in the early 1980s. The first NMT product was a model called the Senator which was followed by the first major success, the Talkman. Was this when the extent of the market was first understood? Vitka says that volumes had grown 20 to 30 times bigger than the forecasts. Nokia focused on NMT mobile phones and their base stations. The techniques for assembling the components improved, enabling larger production series and better user features. Smaller size, less weight, operational versatility, reliability, and a lower price. Exports grew rapidly and soon made up more than a half of total invoicing. But Nokia's then CEO, Kari Kairamo, demanded more. So I request that you build a strategy for the entry uh, to the United States and then uh, we went back home and we built a strategy how to enter the US business. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, we entered at 1985. Cooperation with the Tandy Corporation began, and the production of mobile phones for the American market began in South Korea. Soon, the latest success, Cityman TACS, was introduced to customers in Great Britain. Mobile phones were now to be tailored to suit individual markets. The conquest of the world had begun. Its success factors can be summarized thus. It was our technology and, and, uh, and our product concept. Unlike the analog system, which transmits speech unchanged through the network, the digital system digitizes speech, providing an interference-free and secure environment to transfer data and to offer a virtually endless array of services. 
The Conference of European Posts and Telegraphs, CEPT, built a European digital network. The operating principles and specifications of GSM operations, such as system features, integrated coverage areas, signaling standards, frequencies, and so forth. The world's first digital GSM network was opened in Finland on July the 1st, 1991. And we took at that time, I think, a very brave decision to stop marketing any other brand apart from Nokia. Nokia was going to be the single brand on all our products, all our phones, all our packaging, all our marketing. So a single-minded uh, uh, resolution to really push the Nokia brand. In 1991, there were less than 10 million mobile phone connections in the world. In just nine years, the number had soared to almost 500 million and Nokia had become the world's biggest mobile phone producer. What made it possible? I think the second big issue for us has been moving into product segmentation. Again, 1993, 94, we deliberately introduced three products, the Nokia 1610, the Nokia 2110, and the Nokia 8110, at three different positions in the marketplace each targeted at a very different segment of the end-user market. Phones grew smaller in size while their functions increased. Soon their capacity matched that of two to three-year-old microcomputers. To everybody's surprise, the popularity of short message services rocketed. Young people had discovered the mobile phone and marketing became global. The data transfer card allowed the computer, the fax machine, and the mobile phone to be used together. The Nokia Communicator, launched in 1996, could do all of the aforesaid. Meeting customers' needs in different markets and different cultures requires cross-disciplinary skills because... Well, we have a very broad market, but we want to understand the individual within it. And to achieve this, we need to understand cultural, social, economical aspects, and we need various types of skills for that. As early as the 1980s, Nokia expanded from Europe into all the continents. Great potential was found in Asia, where cultural differences called for new solutions in both technology and design. I mean, we were the number three brand um, in 1996 in Asia, so we were known, but not as the market leader. And uh, so one of the focus areas for me has really been to build the Nokia brand, such that we are now virtually number one in terms of brand popularity. And we're certainly number one in terms of the number of handsets we sell in Asia. Mobile phones freed people from the bondage of time and place. The popularity of short message services in digital phones grew bigger than anyone would have believed. At the same time, the Internet developed into a burgeoning data transfer and communications channel. The addition of email to mobile phones signaled a world of communications that is independent of time and place. WWW is known to everybody. Now so too are WAP, WAP and free wireless Internet. Mobile phones now have many features that make daily routines easier and working life more efficient. Mobile phones can be used to buy travel or concert tickets, check timetables or the weather, buy and sell shares, pay bills, read the news, find the right road in a strange place, search for a missing dog. The list grows by the day. Now that almost everything seems technically possible, when almost all the people in the world may someday be using a mobile phone, the human factor remains. Well, usability is very important. The product needs to feel nice when you have it in your hand and everyone needs to be able to access just the functionality they need in a very easy way. Nokia. Connecting people.